Let's talk about idolatry nowadays, because a lot of the words that we use and, and things that are embedded in our culture, we don't even realize that they have idolatrous associations. And so the question comes up from a Jewish legal standpoint is, can I say these things? Can I be involved in these things? Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about or talking about idols, or do we? The topic that we're going to talk about today is, is it idolatry? And the idea is to sort of explore, first of all, how idolatry came into the world, talk about some of the ways in which some, some contemporary halachic questions as to idolatry in our daily lives, and also to take a look at the world's religions to see whether they would fall under the rubric of idolatry or not from a Jewish perspective. And the reason that we're doing this is not out of a comparative religion class, but we as Jewish people are commanded to be a light unto the nations. And part of our responsibility of being Jews is to be a light to the nations, meaning that we're supposed to teach the world about God and the concept of God is meant to come from us. And so if that's the case, we need to kind of examine where everybody else, where the world is holding in their belief in God. So Judaism teaches that the very first human being, Adam, was a believer in one God. In other words, the question of how idolatry came into the world is actually really peculiar. Because if you have Adam, the first human being, God formed him from the dust of the earth, God blew the breath of life into him, and Adam and Eve live over 900 years and they see generation upon generation come out from them, the question is, how did idolatry come into the world? Everybody knows that that's Grandpa Adam the one that God created, the first human being. So where does idolatry come into the picture? And interestingly enough, our tradition teaches that idolatry didn't take very long to creep up into humanity, that already in the, the grandson of Adam's generation, the generation of Enosh, you had idol the beginnings of idolatry starting to creep in. Now, how could that be? So our tradition teaches that Adam and Eve they believed in God, obviously. They were created by God's divine hands. Uh, the Medrash actually teaches us that when God created the world, all of creation wanted to actually worship Adam because he was such a stellar creature. They wanted to worship him. They, and, and Adam responded to them that, why don't you come along with me and we'll worship the one that really created the universe, namely God. So from the very beginning, a belief in one God is the premise of our Jewish belief, of our Torah worldview. So monotheism is the truth and the starting point, and polytheism is a later corruption. Polytheism came later. It's interesting because that's not the way in which the world tends to look at the, the development of idolatry. Because when you, when you look from a secular perspective, People tend to think, if you're an anthropologist, if you're a historian, if you study the history of religion, you tend to think that first there was a sort of an evolution. It started with worship of ancestors and the dead, and then it moved to polytheism, and then eventually, eventually, it moved to monotheism. There was sort of this evolution of thought in world religion. That's a secular perspective. But that perspective is relatively recent. That perspective dates from the 1800s. The belief of that is a remnant. The belief that they have now is a remnant of that. Because during the 1800s, you know, when we think of the word evolution, we tend to think of Charles Darwin in biological evolution. But there was a trend amongst all fields of study, all fields of knowledge in the 1800s that everything evolved. Whether we're talking about anthropology, history, uh, uh, religion, whatever it was, even governmental systems. Karl Marx in the 1800s, a contemporary of Charles Darwin, thought that, that Marxism was going to be the latest rung, the highest rung, on the evolutionary ladder of government. 
You have feudalism and then capitalism took over. Now Marxism was gonna be the, the ev most evolved form of government. We know that, thank God that didn't happen. But in the 1800s, this worldview was very popular that things evolve. We go from, we go from primitive to more uh, complicated. And it, it go from, we go from uh, primitive to more sophisticated, I should say. And so the, the idea of viewing religion as having evolved from first the worship of, of idols and polytheism into monotheism dates from the 1800s. It's not the Jewish viewpoint. We, from our viewpoint, started out with unity, with, with a belief in one God. Now, what happened? What was it that brought idolatry into the world? So idolatry came into the world, the generation of Enosh, the grandson of Adam, his generation had an issue. They looked at God and they said, you know, God is so vastly superior than all of creation. God is like the CEO of the universe. And if God, if I need something, God is way too busy to care about me personally. And so if I need something practically for me, I'm going to ask one of the designated ministers, one of the branch managers that the CEO of the company has set up. So in other words, if I'm a farmer and I need light and heat to provide uh, nutrients for my plants to grow, my crops to grow, I'm not going to bother God who's manipulating the galaxies. I'm just going to ask the sun directly. I need light and heat, I'll ask the sun. Obviously I know there's a God, but the sun is something that God has set up as a minister to administer light and heat, so I'll just ask the sun directly. Now what happens when it's nighttime outside? and the sun's not out, but I need to ask the sun for something. I need to ask for light and heat. So I will make a golden statue of the sun in order to remind me of the sun, in order to ask the sun for light and heat. So it's this reminder of a reminder of a reminder. And what happened was when the children saw, oh, mommy and daddy, when they want light and heat, they ask the sun directly. And when they want other things, they'll ask the moon and they'll ask the constellations in the sky. Eventually, God is dropped from the picture completely and the center of worship becomes on the sun, the moon, and the stars or on other various natural phenomena. And that's how idolatry crept into the world. So the beginning generation believed that God sort of partnered with other objects or celestial, uh, celestial objects, uh, and that was sort of the helpers or ministers that God used to facilitate, but eventually God was dropped from the picture. So it, it didn't start out, we wanna just worship another God, it slowly devolved. So polytheism is a devolution from monotheism, from a Jewish approach. It starts with the truth, and then it later became corrupted into polytheism. And it's interesting, because one of the early church fathers as well, Tertullian, anti-Semite, I might add, but he had the, he had the idea as well. He coined the, the axiom that truth always comes first, and error always comes later. That the truth is always first, and then it's later corrupted, it turns into error. Which is interesting coming from someone who is a Christian father who is after Judaism, but that's, I guess, for different, uh, a different day. So again, polytheism, from our vantage point, is a, is a corruption of an earlier monotheism. And you find the truth of monotheism, or of the Torah, the Torah's worldview, uh, even predating the Torah. We find even remnants of evidence for it. For example, ancient cultures, how many days in a week universally do we have? Seven days in a week, where does that come from? Why is it there? Why is seven typically a number that is a spiritual number and a number that we just happen to count the days of the week by? There's nothing, there's no, there's no uh, markings that would, that would 
bring significance to the number seven, we find that sort of universally accepted, that the days in a week, there's seven days in a week. Uh, we find also something universally accepted, the idea of the constellations and the uh, astrological wisdom. So there is this wisdom, this Torah wisdom, that predates, even when the Torah was given, we even find remnants of it that are unique to all of humanity. In fact, many cultures within the family of man also have the remnants of stories that we have in the Torah itself. In many cultures, you'll find this idea of a first man and first woman who bring the world into a state of sin. Uh, you'll find ancient cultures that talk about a man and his wife who get into a boat and that the world is flooded, or that they built a great tower and the tower was destroyed, and that's where the languages came from. You'll find the remnants of this in all ancient world cultures. And so there is this sort of original source, this monotheistic uh, root of which all of humanity descends from polytheism, belief in multiple gods, is something that was a corruption that came later beginning in the generation of Enosh because of this mistake. Now, one of the interesting things that, why, so Abraham, we call him the first Jew. Why do we call him the first Jew? We call him the first Jew because he, not that he was the first monotheist in history, but he was the first one to come to monotheism on his own, his own logical deduction, and then spread the word to the, to the people around him. Not just sit with that knowledge himself, but he decided to spread that wisdom to others. And he was combating people in his day that were worshiping the sun, the sun god. That was their focus of influence. And so uh, one of the ways in which he counteracted uh, and he taught people, our sages teach that the, that the Kabbalistic work Sefer Yitzira, which talks about how God created the universe, was authored by Abraham, our forefather. And so that was one of the tools he used to teach people. Additionally, in order to counteract people's worship of the sun, what did he do? He mandated, he told people that he would come in contact with that when they pray to God, the real God, they should face which direction? The west. Why should they face the west? Because that's away from the sun. The sun rises in the east and the grandeur of the sun rising, the imagery is in the east. So if you want to counteract the people that are worshiping the sun god, his, his instruction to them was to face the West, to show that you're turning your back on the sun, to show that you, that plays no relevance in your life. And interestingly enough, the Ralbag, one of the famous medieval Torah commentaries, says that this is one of the reasons why in the Holy Temple, the place of the Ark of the Covenant was in the Western part of the temple, as well as the fact that when the Kohen, when the priest in the morning would, would slaughter the, the daily sacrifice, he would do it with his back towards the sun to show that it has nothing to do, these are the remnants of Abraham, that has nothing to do with any worship of the sun. Nowadays, practically, we, we don't do this because we're not fighting off people that are worshiping the sun. Right, so we, we face the, the heart and nucleus of our faith, which is the place in which the temple stood. So there's no set direction. If you're in America, you face the east, but if you're in China, you face the west, and if you're in South Africa, you face the north, because the nucleus of planet Earth revolves around the nexus of heaven and earth, which is the spot that the temple stood. So let's talk about idolatry nowadays, because a lot of the words that we use and, and things that are embedded in our culture, we don't even realize that they have idolatrous associations. And so the question comes up from a Jewish legal standpoint is, can I say these things? Can I be involved in these things? Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about or talking about idols, or do we? Or do we? Right, when we're talking about manned, some of the first manned spacecraft, and we say the word Apollo, we don't give it a second thought. When we talk about famous fancy footwear, we say Nike, we don't give it any thought. When we say with the old, the old glass thermometers, what was it called, a mercury thermometer? Meanwhile, we've forgotten that Apollo was the Greek god of the sun, that Nike was the Greek god of victory, and that Mercury was the Roman god of travel. 
And so when we say these words, the question is, are we allowed to even say those words? Are we halachically allowed to say these names? And if so, under what circumstances? Because the Torah, the Bible, exhorts a Jew to be careful regarding everything I, God, have taught you. And it says in Exodus chapter 23, verse 13, the name of the gods of others shall not be mentioned in your mouth to be heard. You can't mention the gods of other people. Not supposed to mention. It can't even come out of your mouth. So how can I say Nike or Apollo or Mercury? And so what are the parameters of saying the names of other gods? One practical application, why would you even say the names of another god, would be, would be saying something to the extent of like, meet me by such and such an idol, right? If you wanna, if you wanna use that as a landmark, not, not meet me on the corner of uh, Main Street and, and Knob Hill, you, you say instead, meet me in the corner, meet me by this such and such an idol. Can't do that. Not allowed to use the idol as a, as a reference point. And so uh, another, uh, another additional uh, practical element of this was that you, you wouldn't be able to establish a business relationship with someone that worships idols. Because if you're doing something, if you're, it might cause you to have to say the name or swear in the name of their idol or even to cause them to swear in the name of their idol is not something that we are meant to do. The Talmud offers two notable exceptions. What are the exceptions of when you could say the names of an idol? The first one is that you're allowed to say the names of an idol if you do so mockingly, right? If you say, if you do it in, if you do it in jest, you do it like you're giving it not insignificance, that's one way that you'd be allowed to say it. And also, secondly, the names of idols that are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible itself are also names that you're allowed to mention. So there, there, are, there are certain exceptions to the rule. Interesting, the Chovas Ya'ir, who was a great 17th century sage, he says that there's another type of idol name that you can make mention of, that it's not problematic from a Jewish legal standpoint to mention. And that would be if the original name of that entity pre-existed the idol. So in other words, if someone or something already had that name, you can make reference to it. So in other words, uh, the sun, the moon, the stars, they, they predated, and people were calling, oh, that's the sun, and that's the moon, and that's before they were worshipped as idols. So you can still say, that's the sun, and just say, oh, no, that's, that, people worship the sun. Well, it doesn't matter because that name it already predates the existence of that idol. And so... Uh, all of the astral forces as well, the sun, the moon, the stars, the constellations, you can mention their names, even though people worship them, but the mention of the name predates people worshiping them. Okay. Um, also, if there is a name of a god that is obsolete, nobody worships that god anymore, you would be allowed to say it. So you can say the name Zeus, even though it's not mentioned in the Hebrew Bible. It, um, you could say it because nobody, nobody on planet Earth worships Zeus anymore. The, the worship of Zeus has been completely, um, completely obliterated. So there, it's also permitted to say the name of an idol for the purposes or, uh, or of discussing or clarifying Torah. So if you're, if you're describing something that is going to bring out some sort of Torah idea or Torah value, you're allowed to say the name of the idol. Mainly, mainly you, can't, so you can't say it willy-nilly or to use it as a, as a reference point for something. Now what about places that are named after an idol? So there's an interesting contemporary halachic authority named Rabbi Moshe Sternbach who tolerates uttering the names of idols in situations where people don't realize that the names are actually idolatrous. In other words, that the, the, the word has become so, so generally used and accepted that nobody thinks about, when, when, when you say that name, nobody thinks about the idol. So like Apollo, right? Nobody's thinking of, oh, your, your mind doesn't go to, you go to Neil Armstrong, you don't go to Apollo the God. So if the name has been so used and sort of watered down and become part of the society enough, it's okay to be it would be okay to be mentioned. And he mentions this in the name of cities. So there's a, there's a city in India, Bombay, 
that was named after a god, one of the, one of the Indian gods. And so he said that it would be that even though the actual Indian goddess for whom the city was named was actually Mumbai, and then they changed the city to Mumbai, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter because you, you'd still be allowed to say it because the association has been lost from this particular Indian goddess. So again, since the place has been named after, nobody thinks about it as an idolatrous association, you'd be allowed to say it. Uh, also, Rabbi Ephraim Greenblatt, another contemporary scholar, notes that nowadays street names as well on, only refer to the idols in name. They don't actually conjure up the memory of that idol. So he writes that if a person needs to mention the, the name of an idol when writing an address, Right, you have to write it, you're allowed to because again, nobody thinks about that particular name as something idolatrous. Like did anybody know that Nike was a god? Okay, some, some people knew, some people didn't know. So, but nobody thinks, oh, when I'm buying Nike shoes that that has anything to do with that, the particular, that particular god. Okay, um, if we can avoid saying the name, all the better. Like if there's a way to describe a place name or a street name or whatever that people would, will get the idea and you don't have to actually say it or write it, all the better. Um, but, but technically speaking, there's, there's certainly room for leniency. Now, what about when it comes to dates? Right, the, the months of the year, the days of the week, even the years in which we find ourselves. So the days of the week are all named after Gods. Maybe people don't realize this, but the sun, Sunday is why, because the sun was worshipped. The sun was worshipped by the Norse gods, and the sun was, that was the day dedicated to the worship of the sun. The Romans as well, they worshipped the sun on the first day of the week. Same thing with Monday, right? Moon day, right? That was the day dedicated to the moon. And on Tuesday, right, the third day of the week, right, two, T-I-W, is a, is, is a Norse god that was worshipped on the third day of the week. It was, it was symbolic of what the Romans worshipped with planet Mars, which is why in the Latin languages, how do you say Tuesday? How do you say Tuesday in Spanish? Martes, right? Mars. And if you go through each day of the week, it's either referring to a Norse god or a Roman god. Each day of the week, right? Wednesday. Right? Why is it spelled like that? Right? Because in Norse mythology, Wednesday was the god was the worship of the god Woden. Right? It was Woden's day. Like, why is it Wednesday? Why, why is it spelled like that? Why is it? It's such a weird name. Woden's day became Wednesday. And so the name, what you're saying, the name of an idol. And the same thing on, on Wednesday. How do you say it in Spanish? Miércoles. Because in, in Roman mythology, Mercury was was worshiped. And each day of the week follows that similar pattern. It's all named after either a Norse god or a Roman celestial object, one of the five planets or uh, the moon and the sun. Every single day of the week. So can you say that? It's a god. What about the years? The years, the secular calendar it supposedly begins counting from the birth of the Christian Messiah, the Christian deity, in fact. And so by using that date as a point of reference, one kind of lends significance to that religion, which may be forbidden. Right? If you're saying it's the year 2023, you're giving reference that, what, what, what's, that 20, what's that 2023 from? So you're passively giving significance to a God that is not yours. How does that work? And so, one of the interesting ways that why this is not problematic, I think Rabbi Avadi Yosef uh, mentions this in one of his responsa, that the reason that it's not entirely problematic is because, first of all, JC wasn't even really born in the year 1 CE. Historically speaking, even according to the Pope, he was born closer to between 2 and 7 CE. So the year 1 CE doesn't really, doesn't really represent anything. And so counting, saying it's the year 2023, well, it's not really counting from the year in which he was born. There was a miscalculation, and it's not really counting from anything. So you don't have to really worry about it. Um, 
there are people that are stringent in this, and they, they do go the extra mile, let's say. And the, uh, I remember on when, when, when we had the bris for my son, so they made a little, the moil that came made a little certificate uh, about you know, the date in which he was born. He wrote the Hebrew date, and then he wrote the secular date. And when he wrote the secular date, he abbreviated the months, and then when he wrote the year, it was in, it was in 2014, he wrote two zero 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 one four, like to show that it w he was making a distinction and not calling it by the year. Now, is this required? Not necessarily, but he went. He was going the extra mile just to completely dissociate from any other uh, concept of God that was not that was not our own. Um, when it comes to the months of the year, the names of the first six months of the year are references to idol. January is Janus, February is Februus, March is Mars, and so forth. Are you allowed to say them? We don't realize how saturated our culture is with the remnants of idolatrous references. And so Rabbi Sternbach, who, who, who discusses this, he says, because, because people don't recognize and don't anymore associate the idolatrous origins with these particular months, they're allowed to be uttered, right? And for, especially for the sake of, of consistency in society, you can't tell people that you're going to meet them on the 22nd of ER. You can't tell, you know, when you're uh, at work. So to use, to use the secular terminology is okay from a halakhic standpoint because, again, nobody associates these things with their idolatrous origins anymore. Well, uh, days of the week, we started talking about that. So the conventional names for the days of the week um, in English and German, most of them have, have lost their, uh, their connection with the idolatry that it, that it began in. Um, there... I do want to make note, by the way, there, when it comes to the months, just going back to the months just for a moment, when it comes to the months, there is, there is a halachic issue, though, in using the numbers. Uh, in other words, when you say, like, today's March 2nd, going 3 slash 2, uh, especially, especially in the month of January, where it says, you know, it's 1 slash 20 or whatever, the reason that that would be even more significant uh, of an issue is because there is a, there is a biblical directive in, in the book of Shmois, the book of Exodus chapter 12, verse two, that Nisan is the first month. And so by calling a different month the first month or by calling a different month the third month, that, can, that may be halachically questionable as well. And, and, and it's uh, again, just food for thought. It's not, I'm not saying it's prohibited outright, but there, there would be question regarding that particular principle, not necessarily the idolatrous association, but that Nisan is supposed to be the, six, the, the first month. That's what it says. Okay, so um, there, is, there is an issue with the days of the week that we talked about. Uh, halacha also calls for, uh, halacha, Jewish law calls for uh, referencing the days of the week uh, in, in correlation with the Sabbath, right? It says in the book of Shemais, the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 8, it says, remember the Sabbath day to sanctify it. And the Mechilta Derashbi explains that this commandment entails remembering each day of the week as a function of its correlation to the Sabbath. So how do you say, how do you say, uh, the first, how do you say Sunday in, in Hebrew when we talk about it? Yom Rishon L'Shabbos. That's how you sanctify the Sabbath day. Is the whole week you're, you're relating everything to its, 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 its connection with the Sabbath. So that would be that would be an issue, it's not, it's not forbidden. The, the truth is that once you've already prayed the morning prayer, every day of the week we go through the song that was sung in the Holy Temple uh, that we say, today is the first day of the week, today is the second day of the week. Once you've already done that and identified it, it becomes much less problematic to later on in the day also say that it's Tuesday or whatever it is, because you've already made the reference. Again, I'm not saying that it's forbidden to say it's Tuesday, right? Uh, or it's Wednesday, today is, today is Wednesday, right? Uh, what we're saying is that these are sort of some of the questions that have been discussed in halachic literature through, over the ages and what the issues would be. But you avoid the problem entirely if you 
if you pray every day and you say, okay, this is the, this is the first day of the week to, to, to Shabbat, and then later on call it Sunday. No problem. So far, so good? Okay, so we've talked about how idolatry came into the world. We've talked about some of the modern questions and manifestations of idolatry. Let's take a look, let's take a look for a bit at some of the world religions that are out there and sort of where they fall within the parameters of idolatry. And remember, we're not doing this for, for the sake of a comparative religion class. We're doing this in the sake of we are supposed to be a light to the nations, teaching the world about God. Right? in order to bring Mashiach and, and bring the presence of God to the entire world. Right? It's not just, that's not just something that's for the Jews, it's for everybody. So let's see where everybody's kind of holding in their belief in God. Would, it be, would what, what they believe be considered belief in monotheism, belief in one God, or, or not? So although the prohibition of Avaida Zara literally means strange worship or idol, we, we tend to call it idolatry. And it's something that's not only forbidden in the 613 commandments for the Jewish people, it's also forbidden in the seven laws of Noah, which are for non-Jews as well. In other words, like, why do we care what, what they believe? Well, part of our job, part of being a light unto the nations is to influence the nations of the world to follow the moral code set out by Noah. And one of those prohibitions is not to worship idols, right? To believe in one God, not to worship idols. In order to do that, the, the parameters, though, of what that means for a Jew and what that means for someone who's not Jewish, the concept of one God, belief in one God, uh, may be different for a Jew and for a non-Jew. So a, a Jew has to keep a very clear belief in, in one singular, unified, invisible God that is the source of all. Many authorities maintain that while Jews have to keep such a precise worship, that, that non-Jews are, are given a little bit more leeway, that they are permitted in what we call shituf. Shituf means a partnership, means that you believe in God, but that they, a, per, a person adjoins God with some other force as well, with an idol or another God or another force, a constellation, whatever it is. In other words, it's similar to the way in which idolatry came into the world, the generation of Enosh, where they believed in God, that first generation believed in God, but they said there's also the sun and the sky that has a certain degree of power to it. It's the joining of power, the partnering of God with this other force. Now, there are some halachic authorities that say that non-Jews are allowed to have this sort of belief. And they, they base this belief on the Ramaz ruling in the Shulchan Aruch, where he's, where he's there's, the, there's a passage, there's a, a verse in the book of Shmois, the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 13, to forbid verbally saying the names of another god. And because of this, a Jew is not supposed to enter into a business partnership with an idolater, someone that worships idols, because they may be forced to say the name of their God. But what the Ramah, what the Ramah says is that, and he understands this based on what, what Tosaros writes, that despite the ban on, on partnering with idolater, a Jew is allowed to partner with a Christian. Why? Right? Because Christians, he writes, they, they're not worshiping idols in the traditional sense. They're not worship, even though they believe in a trinity and they believe that JC is part of the Godhead, is part of God, uh, in a manner of speaking, at least many denominations do, um, that they're not the same as the idolatrous pagans from yesteryear. And when they say, when they say JC, they mean... They mean God, they're just adjoining, they're partnering his name with, with something else as well. It's in conjunction to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So as such, the Ramah writes that, that it would be okay to go into a business dealing with a Christian, even though you're not allowed to cause the name of idols to be said by an idolater. And interestingly enough, um, the Goin of Vilna, the Vilna Goin, uh, he cites a Talmudic source uh, which 
which forbids a Jew from practicing shituf, from practicing partnership, but the implication is that a non-Jew would be allowed. It's from the book of Exodus chapter 22, verse 19. It says, anyone who part, it, 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 the, the, the Goyen of Vilna says, anyone who partners the name of heaven with other, with other things shall be uprooted from the world, as it says, only to Hashem exclusively. So the Goyen of Vilna says that the verse that's cited only to Hashem exclusively is talking to the Jewish people. It applies only to the Jews. And he concludes that there's no basis for prohibiting non-Jews from prohibiting Gentiles to adjoining God with some other force, with partnering God with some other force. Now, again, is this the ideal? The ideal is that everybody worship God as one invisible, uh, omniscient, omnipotent God. But would it technically be permitted? Some sources in our tradition say that it would be for a non-Jew, for a non-Jew. Um, there, there, are, there are a lot of interesting, uh, there, there, there's, uh, in, in light of the Ramah's position, Rabbi um, Yosef Shal Nathanson, explains the significance that the Jewish people heard the first two commandments at, of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai uh, from God himself. Right? One, of, one of the things our tradition teaches is that they have heard the first two commandments, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, don't worship any idols. They heard that from God himself, and then it was so overpowering that the people were like, no, we can't take it anymore, it's just too much, and they heard the rest from, with the voice of, of Moses. Now, one of the interesting things that are, that are said by Rabbi Nathanson is that why, why, does, why did the Jewish people need to hear specifically those two commandments directly from God? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't worship idols. Why did they have to hear that from God if that was something that was already prohibited to humanity in the seven laws of Noah? And so Rabbi Nathanson says that the reason is is because that prior to the Ten Commandments being given, prior to, the, in other words, there being a Jewish religion, non-Jews, humanity was allowed to worship Shituf. They were allowed to worship God and conjoin God, partnering God with some other force. And that's why they had to hear it from God directly to clarify this particular uh, this particular idea. I interestingly enough, sam similar thing is done by uh, Rabbi Avadi Yosef, mentions that when when Ruth is coming to convert to Judaism, Naomi, who's, who's guiding her in the process, she tries first to dissuade her from, from joining Judaism. She said, well, it's really hard religion. You're not allowed to worship idols. And the question is, well, non-Jews are not allowed to worship idols either. So what, well, why would that be something that would dissuade Ruth from, from joining the team, from joining Judaism? And what she was saying was that now as a non-Jew, you're permitted in the belief in Shituf, that there's God and that there's another force that God partners with. But now, if you become a Jew, you're no longer going to be able to do that. It has to be one unique view of God. And so this, again, th these are some of the ideas that are, that are said and described. Why would there be a difference between what's what, what, what a non-Jew is allowed to believe and what a Jew is allowed to believe? So, there, there is an interesting idea, and we've alluded to it a little bit earlier. The other nations of the world are under the dominion of a heavenly star, a heavenly uh, mazel, a heavenly angel. After the Tower of Babel, which was humanity's last attempt at uniting, God's like, all right, you guys, when you get together, when you guys all unite, it doesn't work out well. And he changed their languages and he sent them, he created them under different nations. And each nation was going to be a unique nation in of itself with its own talents and abilities. And each one had a representative in the heavens, an, angel, an angelic force that oversaw that nation. And so whenever God wants to give bounty to a nation outside of the Jewish community, he does it through the vehicle, the mechanism of this angelic force. And so since every nation receives its divine bounty through an angelic force, 
they're permitted to associate an angelic force or something else with God. It's like part of their, in other words, that's the way in which they receive it. So consciously, it hits their psyche in that way, and they're allowed to have this broader belief. Whereas the Jewish nation, which was established to be the teachers, the priests, the kingdom of representatives of God's word to the world, they receive their bounty directly from God without any sort of stops along the way, any intermediary force. They are expected to have, they're not, they're not allowed to associate it with any angelic or outside force. The Tzemach Tzedek, the third Lubavitcher Rebbe, mentions this as well in his, in his, uh, in his, his discourses, Derech Mitzvah Secha, which, which explain, this, explain this idea as well. Now, that's one view amongst our sages. Other, others of our sages say no, that a non-Jew is is not allowed to worship Shituf. That they have to worship God in the same way that we worship God. They're not allowed to adjoin, adjoin the name of God with, with other associations. It has to be just God, no partners, not allowed. And so uh, th- this, this does play a role in, in the way in which we view some of the contemporary religions today. Um, Rabbi Moshe Shapiro, for example, he asserts that the Ramah never meant that a non-Jew was allowed to worship Shituf, allowed to worship, partner God with, with another, that it was allowed to believe in it maybe, but not to actually bring that into action and worship something else besides God. So there is some debate and discussion as to whether or not a non-Jew is allowed to pair or partner the divine God with another force as well. Um, one of the interesting things that are mentioned by the Maram Shik is that when it says in the Shema, he says that this is one of the, this is one of the ways in which you kind of know that, that Ananju would be allowed to partner. The, the Maram Shik says that when it comes to the Shema, the nucleus of all Jewish prayer, what does it say? What's the English translation of the Shema? Hear, O who? Hear, O Israel the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, having such a unique conception of God being one is something that's hero Israel, Shema Yisrael. If it was something that was meant to be for all humanity to worship God in that particular construct, then it should have said hero humanity. Right? Not hero Israel. But so, so this, this is, again, there is debate and discussion as to what a non-Jewish person, the parameters of what constitutes idolatry for a non-Jewish person. So now, now that we have that as the backdrop, let's go into some of the modern religions that we, that we know around the world today. And I want to make a clarification statement because there's a very interesting idea that is expressed by the Me'iri, the Me'iri, the famed medieval sage. And he says that even in his day, which is the Middle Ages, even in his day, the Gentiles, the non-Jews that we live amongst now, meaning in his time, predominantly the Christian world, they're not the same status as the pagan idolaters of yesteryear. In other words, that they are governed by what we call civilized religion. That the pagans of yesteryear in Roman times and Greek times, they were involved in all sorts of immorality. Part of their religion was to be involved in immorality. Once Christianity came to the fore, and he calls it, he calls it being under the, under the auspices of civilized religion, which means that, that their belief, even if, they're, even if theologically their beliefs aren't exactly as would be the ideal from a Jewish vantage point, that, that the, they live under a civil moral code so they don't fall in the same status as those idolaters from pagan times. So that's just a preface to when we discuss, we're gonna discuss now Christianity, especially because in America, that's the predominant religion that we, that we find ourselves uh, living with. So let's, let's talk about the first opinion, the first view, and this is something that is really brought to the fore by the Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, who says that Christianity is idolatry. 
And don't forget, the Rambam lived in the Middle Ages. He lived in the times of medieval Catholicism. That was the only form of Christianity that was prominent in his time, in his area. And so the Rambam says clearly, openly, directly, that Christianity is idolatry. He, he talks about it several times, and he mentions, in particular, when, 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 it, when it talking about using the wine of idolaters, you're not allowed to drink the wine of an idolater, he mentions that, that Muslims would not be in this, included in this ban because Muslims aren't idolaters, according to the Rambam. But a Christian, he said, would be counted. In, again, that is medieval Catholicism. So we're going to talk about how that, how that might play a role as well. Rabbi Yosef Chaim of Baghdad also writes that Gentiles who are accustomed to wearing a cross or to uh, worship a cross in their churches don't believe in the unity of God. And they partner God with other deities. They are not considered true monotheists. So conventional wisdom would hold that Christianity ought to be considered idolatry because of the worship and veneration of icons and images as well, right? Uh, be it Jesus, Mary, the cross, all, all sorts of other things that are either bowed to, worshiped, thought about as having some sort of significance. Now, it is interesting, by the way, though, that the Rambam in his commentary to the Mishnah, even the Rambam who says that Christianity is idolatry, he differentiates between the pagan elite, in other words, those that really know the theology, and those that are kind of like the common people who, who kind of just going through the motions. So he says that th those that really know would be considered, and those that don't wouldn't be considered. Now, the, it's interesting that in the 15th century, the 15th century scholar uh, Avram Ibn Migash, who was a, a doctor in the, in the court of Solomon the Magnificent in Constantinople, he says that if the Rambam lived during the Protestant Reformation, that he would be dancing in the streets. Why? Because during the Protestant Reformation, a lot of the iconery and idolatry and statues and images that were so connected uh, and saturate uh, Catholicism were, were taken out. And it, and it, got, back, it got back much more to a, a clearer, uh, more Torah-minded or, 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 or original source of, 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 uh, of a sort of like a Hebrew breakaway religion. Then there, then there are other sages from our, from our tradition that say, no, Christianity is not considered idolatry. The Radak, for example, says most of the world believes in the Torah of Moses and its stories. The only difference between us is that the way in which we regard the commandments. Uh, also, Rabbi Moshe Rifkis, the Ber Hagola, says he takes it a step further and he says that, that they, are, they believe in the creation of the world. They believe conceptually in the same God that we do. They, again, they have a different theological understanding of it, but it's conceptually, it's the God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that took the Jews out of Egypt. They believe in the Exodus. They believe that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, and we view them as non-idolatrous. And he even adds the idea that we're obligated to pray for their well-being. So uh, there, are, there are many different strokes of Christianity. Um, we can't, we don't want to lump every, every group in the same group, but conceptually the, and practically speaking, we tend to not treat Christians as idolaters. Interestingly enough, even if you want to say that Christianity theology is idolatry, that most Christians aren't proficient enough or, or don't, don't understand exa the exact parameters of what their theology actually says. And so even if Christianity itself or the denomination would technically be considered idolatry, the people would not. It's interesting, the Lubavitcher Rebbe makes, makes a distinction sort of in this, in this regard as well, when he indicated at certain points that the theology uh, can be problematic, but, but that the people were sort of just inherited the and inherited the traditions of their parents and are not, would not be liable to be considered actual pagans or idolaters, even if you want to say that Shituf is, uh, is forbidden. So that's Christianity. Islam you, tends to be across the board uh, considered non-idolatry. Uh, that's, that's across the board. Um, there, there are some references to, to Islam having idolatrous elements, but one of the things that are, that are qualified, I think Rabbi Vadi Yosef in his responsa says that 
that, that any, any reference to Islam as idolatry is really just, it, is, it, it's talking about some of the remnant uh, rituals that they have that are from when, Arab, when Arabs were pagans that they've incorporated, but, but it, they aren't associated with another god. Uh, Buddhism does not believe in God officially in their religion, so Buddhism would, they wouldn't be worshiping idols per se, but the, the concept of kneeling to the Buddha and, and the attribution, that would be much more problematic. Hinduism, there aren't, aren't a lot of halachic sources that discuss uh, Hinduism, really, really relegated to the 21st century, so we don't have a whole lot of precedent, but some of the earlier sages, uh, even from the times of the Ga'onim, uh, reference that the Indians in the East, they refer to them as, as idolaters. In fact, Rabbi Pinchas Horowitz in his Sefer Habris says that there are th basically three contingents among, among the world's people. There are those that actual, there are those that are monotheists, that are the Jews and the Muslims. Uh, then there are those that are worship Shituf, the God, partnering God with something else, and those are the Christians, although he doesn't name them by name. And then there are the, the Indians and the Chinese that worship, that are, uh, that are idolaters, or that are worshiping a God that is not our God. There are perhaps other perspectives in assessing that, but that tends to be the, the way in which we view it. Let's, let's, let's summarize on, on this idea. Where, 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 can we, where can we end on, on this point? Now that we've had sort of like a, we know where idolatry came from, we know some of the practical manifestations of idolatrous references in contemporary culture, and we know how to assess world religions, what can we do from here? And what we can do from here is remember that each one of us is charged with a mission. What is the mission? To enlighten the world to the knowledge of God. In fact, the Rambam says that Christianity and Islam did a great favor, great service to the world in the sense that if Mashiach would just come out of nowhere, when it was just the Jews and the rest of the world was worshiping all sorts of paganism, it would have been a very difficult thing for humanity to accept the concept of Mashiach. But because of Christianity and Islam, a silver lining that has been added to the world is that even in the, the, the islands in the middle of the ocean, basic ideas, basic concepts of Torah have been given to all people, all tribes, all nations, all islands. The concept of, of one God, that there's a purpose to creation, that there's reward and punishment, that we have free choice, that there's a destiny in which we are go, that we are reaching, there's a Mashiach, there's a resurrection of the dead. All of these ideas have been given to the world through the mechanism of Christianity and Islam. And it's something that has paved the way so that when Mashiach does come, it won't be such a mind-blowing thing. The people around the world will kind of be ready for it. We, they may have to clarify who it is, but, but the concept of that the world is in a state of exile and needs redemption has already been implanted. Each one of us are charged as lamplighters. Each one of us is supposed to be a light to the nation. So if you have a friend, a neighbor, a relative, a coworker, whoever it is that is not of the Jewish faith, welcome them, talk to them. Encourage them, worship God, bring purpose, bring, bring active knowledge of God into their life, into your life. Invite them to your Shabbos table. Invite them to, not, not that you're trying to convert them to anything, but help them live a life that is more purpose-oriented, that is more godly-oriented. And by doing this, being a torchbearer, being a lamplighter to the world around we bring not only a light and a greater light into our own lives and our own families and our own communities, but we enlighten the, the entire world, bringing it to its ultimate destiny when the knowledge of God will cover the world like the water covers the seabed with the coming of Mashiach, may it be speedily in our days. Click the button below to subscribe to the JLI YouTube channel. It's like a relaxing spa for the soul.